Mm. Cheers. <laughs> Welcome to the Nook on the Voluntary Virtues Network. I'm here today. I'm Steve with Mike. Yo. Christy. John. Howdy. And Matt. Cheers. Oh. What's up? <laughs> dun, dun, dun. Already. Christy, you Already can't be on the started. podcast next week. You spill beer. Those are the rules. Okay? So obviously we're drinking Dorado again. <laughs> <laughs> we're apparently drinking Dorado, which is a double IPA by Ballast Point. We've done it before on the podcast, but... It's Once so again, we're we drinking it. Again. It's good, guys. So throw it's us those good. advertisement dollar <laughs> <laughs> or silver, Bitcoin, whatever you want to do. Beer, yeah. Throw us some Dorado our way. Yeah, <laughs> that'll be perfect. We'll drink it every episode. You keep sending it. <laughs> you keep sending it to us. We'll keep That's drinking right. it. On my pants, that is. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa! On her Woo! pants. Yes. <laughs> That's how we roll. <laughs> and on that point, <laughs> Mike, what are you drinking? Uh, I'm, I'm drinking something a little bit different today, but uh, it's it's an oldie but a goodie. Uh, it's Sarah Nev- it's Sarah Nevada's uh, Stout. It's 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 pretty solid. It's pretty solid. I was looking for um, I was looking for Ruthless Rye. If anybody from Sierra Nevada is watching this, just keep making Ruthless Rye all year round, and I will keep buying it because I love it. Ruthless Rye is pretty good. Yeah, so it's a stout. It's still pretty good. That was that was that was my secondary when I saw. It. I'm like, I'm looking for Sierra Nevada, and Wait, stout's Ruth, close enough. Luke, Ruthless Rye is an IPA. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I thought you guys were saying it was a stout. <laughs> no, no, what he's drinking now is a stout. Okay, all right, all right, all right. <laughs> I was mistaken. Darker is better. If I can hold it up to light, and I don't like coming. I'm not a huge fan of Sierra Nevada, mm-hmm. but their Ruthless Rye is pretty good. Yeah, they, they they hit the mark on that one for sure. Christy, what are you drinking? Pinot Noir. Yeah. As right. usual. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> John. A mango coconut uh, Ooh, probiotic good. drink. It's uh, fermented coconut water, more or less, with. Uh, Is it a kombucha? It, it's like a kombucha, but, but it's, it's uh, coconut. It's, it's oh coconut, wow, exactly. that's neat. Sounds that's delicious. Good. I've never heard it's that. really good actually. Yeah. And it, actually, this company Cavita makes one that's uh, called Mojito, which is a uh, lime. Ooh. Oh yeah. And yes. Yeah, that's sounds good. Vodka. Help me out, Tim. Yeah. Lime and coconut, obviously, and mint. There we mint, go. Yes. Perfect. Uh, yeah. It's sense. really good. That sounds good. Yeah. Yes, yeah. it's mojito. Yeah. It would make sense that it would have mint. I shouldn't have been floundering like that. Y'all should have been like mint. <laughs> <laughs> mint, man. <laughs> mojito, mint. Remember. <laughs> Crush, not sliced, right? They're supposed to be mojito. You're supposed to like press it, not like I don't know. You're thinking of mint it. julep. Mint you, julep, yeah. Uh, you're supposed yeah. to press it, not. Yeah. Oh, you crush know. the in the mojito. You crush it on the ice. Okay. Yeah. Oh, there you go. Yeah. I just drink it. <laughs> 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 Matt says that sounds like too much work. <laughs> All right, yeah. Matt, what are you drinking? I'm also drinking the Dorado. Yes. I was gonna buy Sculpin, but then I was like, Dorado's the same price. It's. Thirty percent more alcohol for zero percent more. <laughs> <laughs> Deal. Take my money. <laughs> so anyway, this week we're discussing uh, an idea that was. I, I'm sure we've all uh, we've discussed this kind of topic before, not on the podcast, but amongst ourselves. Uh, the idea of peer-to-peer mutual aid type organizations. Uh, John Bush gave a talk at Libertopia and called him Freedom Cells. Bob Pulaski, that's how you say his name, right? Podolsky. Podolsky. He's got a book, and he gave talks at Libertopia as well. He calls them octologues. But the basic idea is that you form a small core group, and other core groups form up in your general area, which then forms a larger group. And then larger groups form larger groups. And when you're at about 800 people or so, you can basically just forget about the state. The state becomes obsolete at that point. In that in that particular community, in a sense. Right. Yeah, that area, geographical location, whatever. You, know. you, you have to start with a small group, though, of 8 to 12, and then you get 8 to 12 of those and 8 to 12 of those. Yeah, it it does make a lot of sense to me. I mean, I, I, uh, nothing, uh, nothing against Bob uh, Podolsky exactly. I mean, it, but I don't really necessarily think it, it requires that much detail in into into the actual theory itself. But I understand what he's saying. Like, you know, he's trying to come up with a name for it of exactly how, like how it should work. Is that kind of what like? Well, I think, I think. 
to reason the number eight comes up plus or minus one right, right. is because it's the uh, he has research uh, that says that eight's the magic number where you can you have the most creativity uh, the most opportunity for creativity and uh, the most opportunity for consensus so if you drop the number lower then you have less potential creativity and greater consistent consensus ability okay. ability to, to, to arrive at consensus okay. and if you go over eight you have more creativity but less opportunity to, to find consensus. So that's the reason we come at, we, I mean, that's the reason that this number eight keeps, right, right. keeps okay. coming right. up. And uh, yeah, so I think that speaks to why the eight, or uh, I've seen, obviously we've also seen the eight to 12 number thrown around mm -hmm. too. So it's somewhere right. in there. The idea is to be able to have a group small enough that you can uh, uh, arrive at consensus and, and, and be creative enough to, to, uh, or not just creative enough, be able to be diverse enough so that you can hopefully have your own internal economies. Yeah, anyway. Well, and consensus is key because, you know, right now most people live in a world of democracy where 49%, 51%, you know, rule the 49. And so that's all they know. So the thought of getting everyone to agree is very foreign to people. So if we can do it in smaller numbers and have successes, mm -hmm. people will understand that it's not an immediate thing. Consensus is a con constant, you know, s not a sell job, but you have to constantly go back and look at the needs of people and what are, what are, where are they not understanding something or what do they have to bring to the conversation. It's, it's, it's a new kind of thing for people to get, and it's easier to do in smaller units than it is in, you know, thousands of people. I think it's important to be independent as well. You ha I've, seen, I've seen many of these groups in the past flounder because you have a couple of leaders amongst the group and everybody else pretty much follows the leader. And the whole idea of hierarchy kind of destroys the group, essentially. Uh, you, you start getting infighting amongst people who support this leader versus that leader, or... Social climbers, mm -hmm. yeah. Right. Yeah. People, pe yeah, exactly. People who want to become part of the leadership, and, and it, it causes strife, especially when you have one or two people making decisions for the whole group. I, I, I think uh, another important thing to talk about when you're talking about something like this would be possibly allowing some people in the group to make a decision contrary to the majority. So if, if somebody does not want to follow along with what most people are doing, as long as they're not hurting anybody, as long as it, you know it's all voluntary. As, oh, absolutely. You know, I, I think that's important to recognize and if you're setting up such an organization. So allow the seven to act and the one not, just not yeah, to so, act. So, well, so everyone can key. say, hey, we're yeah. doing this. Yeah. Whoever wants to help us yeah. out, let's let's yeah. do it this yeah. way. Yeah. Th that, that's key. I mean, yeah. I, I, I think, think it's really good that we jumped onto the word hierarchy real quick. Because right. that, that's something right. like, yeah. you know, I mean, for lack of a better way to describe it, I mean, like nip it in the bud. That's where the problem is, the fact that you've got people that, that, that say that they speak for an entire group without really being able to really prove that at all, you know, I mean, like, oh, okay, so I speak for this group. Oh, really? How's that? You know, <laughs> like, you know, that that's that's where that whole thing is that you get, you know, way back when thousands of years ago, you have like the, tr you know, the, the head of the tribe who you know started putting a crown on and stuff like that. You know, you're yeah. The, so. you're, you're actually uh, bringing up exactly. What I was going to tie that into what Matt and Steve were saying is you can hit Pater by going back and look at the Iroquois Confederation and see how, okay. how they did it, right? And uh, in the sense that if someone didn't, you know, arrive at consensus, they didn't want to relocate with a group. They weren't made to relocate with a group. Yeah. Know? I mean, it wasn't, there wasn't, you didn't have to go. Right. But right. they did go to great lengths to, to hammer out, you know, have a conversation and hammer out details and arrive at, at, at a consensus decision that not everyone was obligated to yeah. do, but that, that you know, they, they did go to that, that length. Yeah, so there was a, there was opportunity for individuality and, and yeah. Yeah. And, and, yeah, and and if you do find yourself in a, you know in, in a community, um, 
like that. I, I, I think I can consider pretty much everybody here a community like that. I think we, we've been together long enough. We're pretty close, and we, we trust each other's judgment that it's very important that, like, you know, if, you know, if everybody's really all about a certain idea, it might be a good idea for somebody to just be devil's advocate and be like, hey, what if this happens? Just to throw it out there, just to see if it sticks, you know, just because, you know, everybody gets all on an idea and they get really excited, and that's wonderful for everybody really excited about an idea, but every now and then it's a good idea to just be like, hey, did anybody think about, like, what if this happens or what if that happens? If you just say that, not that it's going to bring everybody down or something, but it, it's, it's a good point to be like, well... Dude, everybody make sure you consider the alternative. What if, you know, what we didn't want to happen happens? And it's always kind of good to do that. And, and don't ever be fearful of going against the group just to be the cautious one. That doesn't mean that you don't agree with it. You're just saying, hey, what about this? You know, that's really important to just always kind of think about all the alternatives and, and don't be afraid to put it out there. Yeah, I think, I think discussion amongst the group is key. Um, I, I think that people in these kind of groups need to feel uh, feel safe enough to feel uh, welcome enough to speak their mind without fear of being being pummeled out an outsider or yeah, right yeah. or judged ridiculed. Or, yeah, yeah ridiculed. ridiculed that's what but, I was yeah. looking for ridiculed yeah. Yeah. A good example of that would be if, like, say you're part of a group and somebody says something and the reaction of the group is to say, she's a witch, burn her, perhaps that's not a group you should be a part of, you know? Like, if somebody all of a sudden says something, you know, obvious of what the group is saying, everybody's like, how could you, no, 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 no. Maybe somebody was a little bit too judgmental and they're, they're trying to create a uniformity out of, you know... Uniformity is kind of a scary thing in, in general if you really think about it. If we were all wearing the same clothes and looked exactly the same way all the time, I'd be a little bit creeped out if I was talking to everybody and they uh, all saw the exact same way I did, Wait, right? What if she yeah. turned conformity. Yeah, conformity, yeah. Not, yeah. not necessarily conformity. Conformity. Yeah. Conformity. Yeah. Right. yeah, 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 conformity. Yeah, no, yeah fair no, enough. No, I think, I think uh, it was, it's interesting to note uh, with uh, our group that did that does security right. at Libertopia that we discussed last week. Mm-hmm. I, I always I always thought it was awesome how everyone was the head of security. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That, that, if somebody that came that into awesome. the into the <laughs> and said, "I need to speak to head of security," whoever, whoever you were talking talk to, to, that was head of security. <laughs> <laughs> and, and and you know it's it's really important too to have a level playing field like that, not only for people within the group to feel. To feel like their voice is being heard, but also for the outside, yeah. because when you have a head of the snake, so to speak, right, you cut off the head of the snake and the the body dies. Mm -hmm. But if there is no head of the state of the snake, yeah, there's nothing. There's there's no point to attack. There's no individual to attack that will destroy the group. And, and you look at when like uh, uh, you know uh, say there's some sort of organization that whatever this state may be and this. You know, it goes back to probably the beginning of the state, however many thousands of years ago you want to call that, that whenever there's a group that is, you know, against the, the, the status quo or the, or the state as is, um, they look for the leader or the organization always. Who, who's the guy running this? Who's in control here? So if you have somebody who is in control or the leader, that's the person they're going to make their life very difficult. So if there's no leader, then they're all, they don't know what to do. They because that's that's a whole mindset. That's the way they've been trained in whatever sort of you know agency or whatever government group they're with. That's what they've been trained to do is to they have a hierarchy. So they're assuming every other organization has the exact same thing. Yeah, they can't perceive an organization without a hierarchy. Yeah. So when there's not a hi if the, when there's not a hierarchy, they don't know who to go after. Yeah, very good point. I should have known that two years ago. <laughs> <laughs> you should probably speak to, like, uh, um, the mutual aid aspect of it. Yeah. Yes, oh, yeah. absolutely. Um, so... Kind of how anonymous, <clears throat> it's kind of how anonymous is working. Uh, right. Yeah, that's, that's not a bad example. Yeah, for yeah. sure, yeah. But the mutual so you're, aid. You're, spe you're speaking, you know? yeah. Oh, the yeah, hierarchy. Yeah, yeah. Right. Hierarchy. Hi that was a, hi a hierarchy. point to right. hierarchy. Right. Right. Yeah. But the mutual aid. Bring, go into the mutual aid part <laughs> of it. <laughs> yeah. So uh, the idea is, is speaking to like the in internal economy aspect of it. Uh, that um, uh, you depend 
as much as possible on that group or the networks, adjacent networks, right. if you will. How does that work? Like, really? Like, like give an example of the eight and the, the you know, the multiples of it. Well, let's reality. just say, let's just say you had an electrician in the eight, you had a, 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 a dentist in the, in your eight, or, you know, you'd use them as much as possible, bartering as much as possible within that group, or within one of the adjacent, adjacent networks, if you will, uh, a, a, and subverting the the economy as much as possible. Yeah. Agorism. Yeah. I think is exactly. The, the that's exactly. That's exactly. Agorism. It. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Agorism. Right. Yeah. So, and, and, and so also in, in a defense system, let's say you're homeschooling and uh, a neighbor doesn't like the idea that you've got your child, you know, playing outside at it, it, at <laughs> 10 a.m. <laughs> yeah. in the morning when all the other kids are at school, right? So they call uh, call the the enforcers on you, right? And then you get a situation where the enforcers are ready to take your child away. If you can call on your eight and their eight or whatever and be able to to uh, put a wall between right, yeah. the, the enforcers and, and and you and your child or whatever the case, and at least it uh, it uh, tells the it sends a signal, right? right. That that hey There's an app actually. What I forget what it's called. Enforcer or something like, like that. Peace, 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 peacekeeper. 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 Yeah, yeah, yeah. peacekeeper. It's a very good app. Check it out if right. if you so have the time. Instead of calling the police oh, that's or a something, great idea. you yeah, right. press a button oh, which sends right. out a, a text that's message awesome. to your group. I love it. When are we starting this, guys? Come on, it, already, it exists. I mean, this yeah. is no, no, but like. Yeah. Oh, like yeah. when, when do we download it on all of our phones? Am I supposed to do that today or tomorrow yeah. or something? Download it and yeah. see if you can get that set up. But yeah, you also you also practice together, train together. Um, uh, food is another fo- food co-ops. Right. Um, growing, uh, say say John grows a bunch of fruit. Yeah. And I grow avocados. Av- yeah. Yeah. The idea is we want to get each. And, you know. You want to get that 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 group, each group, to be as avocado is fruit, but independent, <laughs> yeah, independent as possible. You know, uh, uh, self uh, reliant as it, possible. Yeah. And if if you can have these work uh, these groups working out and actually showing that you don't need a government or a hierarchy even in order to function as a society, then you you're gonna have this idea spreading more and more, uh, especially if it is like, yeah, if there's no force involved, it. If, if people are going to recognize it's a better idea than using government and having the taxes taken from them, not having a say, a real say, at least, in the system. Yeah, how, how many times have have we gone to protests or something and it feels like you're banging your head against the wall? This is something you can actively do. Actions speak louder than words, so people are going to see how you're living right. See how you're getting along with. It's like mission work almost, in that it respect, is, right? It when is. people sure. see, yeah. Yeah. yeah, when people yeah. see like how you have, uh, your, have, relationships that are rich. You know, that's what everybody really wants: mm-hmm. rich relationships. You know, I mean, everybody wants that. That. Uh, it's an action, though. It's not just theory. Right. No, but yeah, it's it. also right. yeah. yeah. I think it's also important to uh, like any organization. Obviously, I don't think it needs to be pointed out here, but doesn't advocate use of government and doesn't you know doesn't want subsidies or any any real help from the government i think that's important with the whole line of thinking to prove that we don't need them once we can prove that it the idea is going to be hard to stop well i think once we provide an alternative and that's what people want they want solutions especially like they can't see a lot of people can't see the stepping stones to how we can get beyond the state and this is just, you know, if we do it ourselves. And, and it's a, and a peaceful way to get yeah, there. it is. And it is. Ferguson is a great example, that's in the news right now, of showing that people are fed up with yeah. the system the way it is. People are fed up with the militarization of the police. People are seeing how these institutions are becoming increasingly corrupt and not serving the people. I, they never serve the people, but people are. It's becoming more and more obvious. And we're paying taxes to a system 
of managers that we'd rather see locked up in yeah, jail. Really? Right? <laughs> oh yeah, really. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, but the but right now there isn't an alternative for them, and by creating these cells or octologs or whatever right. you want to call them, right. we're giving people a solution mm-hmm. while also creating a freer a freer life for ourselves. It, it's funny, like. Uh, Steve and I had this conversation, and Tim and I had this conversation. We were talking about this before Libertopia and Octologues and all that. You're just talking about how if, for instance, I were in a position to be, uh, uh, you know, a land baron, if you will, if I had <laughs> the land, I'd volunteer, and I say that truly I would, uh, if there was a way we could all go on one piece of land and, and, and have our own internal economy, you can actually study some some. Uh, communes that have been successful, the ones that have been, that have private private property aspects to them as well as mutual aid aspects. There are a few that are successful. But anyway, if if we could go on one landmass and do it, uh, that's one way. But this model shows that actually you don't have to be geographically co-located. Mm-hmm. You can you you can be in different parts of the county, as an example, or different parts of the town and be able to network like this. But. Yeah, as long as you're in communication with other right. people who have the same mindset as you do. You know, right. I uh, don't mean to get too far uh, off, 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 the, off the chain here, but I do think it, it's important to n- uh, mention that we mentioned uh, agorism earlier, and I was thinking, well, agorism, okay. So if there's any newbies watching, if you don't know what agorism is, if I, if I can sum it up in a sentence, uh, agorism is stop asking for permission. Just, <laughs> just do it. If you want to do it, just do it. You know, and if, but if you want to be with, safe, you would be recommended to do it with a group of people who are in the same mindset within, as you. But within the uh, parameters of the non-aggression. Exactly. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Of course. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Not. Yeah. You know. Not to to harm anybody else. Right. So, but yeah. Anyway. So we, we were talking. Uh, you know. Uh, you, you're saying communes and ones that have been successful. Uh, right. You know. Uh, the only thing I could, I could, you know, recommend when it comes to commune is that uh, you should probably get a well if you can, you right. know, because that that's that's the one thing that everybody needs is water, and if you get into some weird situation with whatever local thugs, aka government, uh, you're gonna want to have the water supply I, isolated so they can't cut it off. Make sure it's I'm, a deep well too. I yeah, was, make sure it's a deep one. They can cut you off by drilling deeper. I was. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah. that's true. They could, they could, yeah, oh, leak it I out. Yeah. Thought of that. It's going to take him a while, though. <laughs> you can yeah. see him out there with a the drill. Wait a minute. <laughs> yeah. No, I I was thinking, I think it was inspired by one of our earlier podcasts, but maybe a community, uh, you, you find, first of all, you need a prime location uh, where you don't think the government's going to fuck with you. Right, right. Number yeah. one. But, but then you also, you keep in mind that if they do, you might need to take off. So you have it in mind that most of the stuff is mobile. Maybe not everything. Helicopters. No, I, I mean, I mean, like, uh, like your housing is somehow you're able to throw it on some trucks. Gypsy can. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I don't know. But like, I mean, I mean, I, I wouldn't want to live in like some cheap shit though. Like, I'm so talking like some that? badass, like I don't know, eighteen wheelers oh, where that would be cool. this shit like yeah. unloads off the side. I don't know. I'm not sure yeah, how you'd set cool. it up. Pikey it up. Well, something badass. <laughs> it'd have to be I think, I think, I think that's r- something you should discuss amongst whatever group you. Yeah, yeah, yeah right. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, exactly. There's room for these things could take shape Transient, or look yeah. like. You know, look wildly different from one of the exactly. spectrum right. to the Whatever next. The group's comfortable and not even with, yeah. not even every octologue, if you want to call it that, not even every group has to be ideologically the same, mm-hmm. as long as they accept the fact that they can't use government force. Well, yeah, or right. aggress, yeah, aggress right. against aggress. another. Yeah, right. exactly. yeah, yeah, right. And they so, have a mission. Or so you could yeah, you could have one, for instance, yeah. that's totally anarcho-communist, as an example, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, as long as they can agree not to aggress on anyone else, then there's nothing saying that that group of eight can't engage in commerce right. with another group of eight who doesn't necessarily ideologically align, right? So well, they wouldn't call it I commerce. Mean, through, they would call it through the, whatever, 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 whatever the whatever. needs are. You're, they you're, inter- you're exchanging goods and services. Yeah. Not, yeah. not just yeah. goods yeah. and services, yeah. though, but ideas. You, right, one, yeah, ideas too. Yeah. Data, so information. You, right. Yeah, you, the, you might exchange ideas and say, hey, we're doing it this way. And the two groups might say, hey, you know, yeah, you're doing it better. And we should change the way we're doing it. So yeah. it's, it's important to have those exchanges of ideas. And as long as, like you said, they're not using force against anybody. 
like there's not a problem. You, you were, if we're talking about the like the future a little bit, I, I think there's you know in the uh, you know if you want to call it the ANCAP community, there's a, there's a lot of like demonization of, of what you of what you might call uh, anarcho communism and and you know the, you, we may ideologically have our differences with it, but you know we're saying in the future there's there's two communities. One of them's leaning more towards the the market anarchy, and the other one's leaning more towards the anarcho communism thing. I honestly don't believe the anarcho communists are just going to be like, get them and attack. I right, just no, don't see no. that happening. They're going to have their disagreements and they may or may not want to engage with them as, as a separate community, but I just don't see this sort of like antagonism that, you know, some people might say, like, oh, well, that's what's going to happen. They'll never learn to cooperate. I'm pretty sure everybody's going to learn how to figure things out. Good, good point. Yeah. Like, I think, uh, I mean, if you look at Claire, uh, Claire de la Volterine, right? She says anarchists without, object- uh, without adjectives. And that was healthy even in her day, which, mm-hmm. you know, late 1800s. And uh, if you look online now, you see a growing presence of that kind of conversation going on where yeah, absolutely. anarchists, uh-huh. essentially, anarchist theory, uh, are united, at least, in what they see as the, the fundamental problem is hierarchical organization. Yeah. So reorganizing laterally, um, and, and but we, people could have hierarchical organizations if they all wanted to. If they all wanted if to. If they all but, wanted to, they could. Well, no? I, I mean, like that's uh, yeah, you, I can right. see that. But but yeah. I mean, once you start looking at it, the problem ra- rationally, that's what you start right. right you start when really disagreements happen. The hierarchy comes into place on who. Yeah, but who some people gets like that way. though. I'm just saying, some people, some people like. <laughs> to some have, people do. Not well, they gonna lie. That that's true. But it's sort of like we can't. We won't go back to slavery. You know what I'm saying? But that's us. But I'm saying there are people who are just fine. Humanity, maybe initially, but humans have socially evolved. Right? right, you will never go back to right. chattel slavery. You right, know? no, you will not see people in bondage. You know, unless something really, really bad goes down. Right, <laughs> yeah. but uh, uh, essentially, humanity, humans have evolved socially to accept a sense of morality. It is immoral to own humans. Right, and we're not going back there. Right, once you remove hierarchies, you know, and it will t- be generational. I'm right. sure, but. It'll be just the same. Hierarchies will be viewed as essentially the the, the remnants of slavery. So, yeah, because right. ownership is really about control. When you have control of something, and, and when you have control over somebody else, it's a sort of a form of ownership, which I think is hmm. kind of where I have yeah an issue with it. Kind of. <laughs> <laughs> okay. No, but no, but the point. The other point I'd like to make is that I've I've talked to people who have been in similar type groups with hierarchy, and they always fall apart. Mm. At least they often. I won't say always because well, states have always failed. You know, states always yeah. fail. That's it's it. That's it on the grand years, right? scale, yeah, right? That's, true. You know, it is. that's it right. on the grand right. scale. Yeah. Stale, states yeah. always fail. Yeah. You know? There's a there's a good uh, uh, Mahatma Gandhi quote. Uh, at, at, at one point, and I'm going to absolutely butcher this thing, but it, it goes something like, at one point, every tyrant looks like an undefeatable force, but with, without fail, every single one has fallen, always. And humanity lives on. <laughs> states, so always, <laughs> states always fail, but humanity always prevails. So Profound. far, like you said, <laughs> but uh, it's. I, I think the trend will live on. That's just evidence that we don't need the state. Look at how far, lo- how long humanity has lasted, and how many attempts governments have had at destruction, death, all all sorts of horrible acts. And multiple different attempts at like total control too. I mean, yeah. just total like this is oh, what yeah. you're doing. This is how it's going to work. And long enough time frame. Yeah. How many totality. empires have tried to run the world? Yeah. <laughs> Too many. You know. <laughs> yeah. You've got quite a number of examples of that, and most of them don't very last very long at all. I mean, a couple notable examples of longer lasting is you know you've got uh, uh, a couple dynasties in China that lasted a very long time. They were pretty horrible to their people. Obviously, the Roman Empire right. ended when. Uh, 
when the barbarians would invade some town in France or, or northern Italy and the townspeople would be like, oh, you mean you guys aren't going to tax us as much? Okay, you're cool. Uh, you know, that's how you know when the empire is known when the people who are supposed to be the enemy invade. And you're like, oh, okay, you guys are cool now. Whatever. Yeah. Essentially, <laughs> when we remove the, the hierarchies from which the psychopaths hide behind, you know, that's when we will realize peace and, yeah. and humans will realize their inherent humanity. You know, that's the way I, I view it personally. So, so I have a question, though. Do you think that in these octolog or, or freedom cells or whatever you want to call them, would robot sex be more or less likely? Are they, yeah. Yeah, that, yeah, are they part of the eight? Did they are they robots? <laughs> well, that's yeah. a good point, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. Could they be part of yeah. the eight? Would <laughs> robots be part of the eight if it was, if it was sentient? I think so. so <laughs> oh, you, but we're out of time. But we know we have oh, an interview man. coming up about that. Yeah. 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 Uh, unfortunately, I screwed up and, w- and the... Totally. Pa- and the interview with Scott Beezer got cut off last week. I'm going to try and tack it on to the end of this week. So, Scott, if you're watching, it should be at the end of this podcast. And no. I'm sorry to everybody that <laughs> I screwed up last the week. The long-awaited robot sex interview <laughs> did happen. Yes. Robot sex interview. This is not the robot sex no. episode, it's as we said se- last episode. week. This is not the robot sex but episode but you're this looking is for. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, <laughs> the droids you're looking for. Have there it is. Peace out. Good Have a good one. We decided to go up here and do an interview today with Scott Beezer. Uh, he's author of Quantum Vibe. It's a graphic novel. And uh, I've been reading it on and on for the past. Uh, how long have you been doing it? A year, year and a half? Yeah, I almost forgot when I started. Yeah. It was like in early in 2011, I believe, is when this series started. And mm-hmm. it's, it's, it's it's an open-ended series, but it has does have story arcs of varying lengths. And mm-hmm. it's sort of this grand story arc that's going to wrap up this summer, and then I hope to continue it after that. And so you've got two volumes that you, you can purchase on your website. Right. Um, is it is that through Big Head Press, or is it just off of Quantum Vibe, or does it link to Big Head Press? Uh, you could go to either quantumvibe.com or bigheadpress.com and get it there, or you can go to Amazon. Okay, you can get it on Amazon. Yeah. Cool, cool, cool. So I, I, I guess, I, you know, as, as reading your work, I'm sitting there thinking like, well, okay, so, so this is an interesting dude, and you don't see too many like, uh, uh, libertarian authors that are doing graphic novels. That's really, really unique in general in society. Most people don't give in that. But think about that specific niche for this group of people, you know, and so. I, I'd heard about them before, but I go, I don't know if that really entertained me too much, and I stumble on yours, mainly because uh, an ad on LRN drilled it into my head. If you guys don't know about the Liberty <laughs> Radio Network, mm-hmm. they, you know, they play ads, and there's five of them, and we'll, we'll run four months. That's actually part of the reason I got into Bitcoin, too. Subliminal messaging. Well, not so subliminal <laughs> messaging. But uh, So I started thinking as I was reading your, th- your thing, you know, how, how did you get involved in this? I mean, were you, were, you, uh, were you an artist first and then found the philosophy of liberty? or? Well, I, in some ways I've been an artist since I was three years old and just started drawing. Mm-hmm. But uh, I became a libertarian roughly at age 19 as I was in college. And at that point I thought I was going to go into journalism. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And uh, I had some art skills, but I hadn't really developed them very well. But I thought, well, maybe I could be a political cartoonist. Maybe I could be the libertarian Jeff McNally. And if you're not very old, you might not even know who that is, but he was a fairly well-known conservative cartoonist through the 70s and 80s, and then he died a little too young. Mm -hmm. Uh, Then I got into the real world of journalism and realized how corrupt and messed up it was and then decided that that wasn't really for me after all. I went back to art school Mm -hmm. and got my chops in and started working as a commercial artist. First, I worked for a textbook publishing company, and then later I worked for a computer game company. And in the dot-com crash, I lost that game company job, and I decided mm-hmm. that would be the point at which I would strike out in, on my own as a mm-hmm. cartoonist. And I got together with my brother, who had been smarter than me, and he went into uh, computer science instead of art, and so mm-hmm. he had money. Yeah. And we found a big head press to publish. Cool, cool, at first, cool. the, the first focus was graphic novels, and so right. we had the probability wrote a graphic novel, which was an adaptation of L. Neal Smith's first novel. And we continued from there with the original stories. Mm-hmm. And at first we just used the internet as, as, as just one way of marketing the book. We just put a sample of, of the first 40 pages up and then hoped that right. people would want to buy the book to finish the story. That worked sort of well, but It's an interesting well. idea, yeah. Yeah, but then what we decided to do was put the whole book up. Mm-hmm. And then we sold, you know, we sold X number of books the first time and then we uh, the sales tapered off and we put the whole book up there and then we sold X again. Right. So we discovered that really to, to sell it, you got to give it away in, 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 in this kind of mm-hmm. in this kind of world. Yeah. And as I continued working this way, and I did some more graphic novels, I was looking at what other people were doing, and it seemed like 
uh, episodic comic strips were, were really a better fit for the web because mm -hmm. people experience the, the web as kind of a daily exercise. Yeah, they pour out their coffee. And, right, yeah, they pour yeah. out their coffee, they read some comics, and they get to work, and then they read some more comics, and they work a little more. You know, so mm -hmm. so uh, a few years back, we decided to shift our focus from one-shot novels to continuing strips. Mm -hmm. And the first strip we tried was something called Escape from Terra. And I was still involved in finishing up a different graphic novel at the time, so what we did was we hired an artist, right. and then I worked with Sandy Sanford to, to do the story, mm -hmm. and that worked reasonably well. We built, we built, uh, we, we we found a way to do uh, an update five days a week, mm -hmm. uh, even though you know doing the kind of art we do was kind of labor intensive. We couldn't right. could manage seven quite well not without hiring more artists, mm -hmm. and so we did five, and that went, worked pretty well, and. Then when I finished my last graphic novel project, which was uh, Phoebus Crumb, uh, which was uh, another L. Neil Smith book, mm -hmm. I, when I launched Quantum Buy. This was a story that I had been developing over 10 years, mm -hmm. just different right. ideas. And, and just an idea would float in and out of your head as yeah, you're like, eating uh, food in the morning, like, oh, it's finally okay. starting to go, yeah, yeah, maybe I can do this, maybe I can do that. And I, I kind of set up a future world set 500 years in the future. Mm -hmm. Uh, in which in which uh, humanity is spread throughout the solar system, mm -hmm. and they're still colonizing the outer worlds. But in in, in a s one sense, it's kind of kind of starting to fill out. The frontier is kind of starting to disappear, mm -hmm. and there are the same kind of social problems that humanity's been facing in the yeah, present they time. They don't go away even if you're yeah, yeah. 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 on a space station, yeah. right? Yeah. So. Um, they couldn't go to the stars because, uh, for two reasons. One is that uh, they never came up with a, a really workable faster than light drive, something that was mm -hmm. really practical. There's theoretical ones that right. will work drive, but it requires so much energy that it's just, you know, mm -hmm. you can't do it. And also because deep space uh, is clumpy, has clumpy with dark matter. So you got these great big clumps of dark matter out mm -hmm. there, and so you can't navigate because you can't see them until you feel the gravitational effects. Right. So we had this mad scientist named Seamus Amurugu, who's like really old. And he's come up with what he thinks is a solution to the problem, and right. that is uh, find a way to bridge the gap between the alternate universes. Like so, that's the one thing that's stopping everybody, slowing them down at least, you know. Well, no, what it is is kind of a different way out of the problem. If you can't okay. go to the stars, what mm -hmm. you do is you, you find the other variations of the star system you're already mm -hmm. in, and then you bridge oh, that gap. Oh, okay, yeah, I see. Then yeah, you okay, colonize yeah, the uh -huh. alternate Earths and the alternate Marses and the alternate, uh -huh. you know, other... other Solar, you know, solar planets that mm. we're already familiar with, and the advantage of that is you already know where all the minerals are. <laughs> you know, you just yeah, go oh, and yeah, get them, yeah, right. Yeah. And it, it kind of reminds me of. Do you remember that show Sliders? Was it Sliders? It's a little like that. Although yeah. you know, you would hope that they would be ethical and only go to alternate Earths that didn't already have people in them. Right. Yeah. yeah. Although you know, you, there's also always a danger that the less ethical people will go in and conquer the the alternate Earths that are less mm -hmm. technologically advanced. Right. 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 So anyway, that's that's the uh, the starting point of the story. And so in order for uh, our mad scientist to, to pull this off, he has to hire this young ingenue assistant, uh, Nicole Ram, mm -hmm. and this, she's really the central character of the story. You really right. see most of the action through her eyes. And they go from Mars, I'm sorry, from Mercury to Venus to Earth's moon mm -hmm. to uh, Mars and the Jovian satellites mm -hmm. and Saturnine satellites as part of the project they're doing to try to put together, get, gather the information they right. need in order, to, in order to build this universe bridging thing. And as they visit each world, you see the different kind of cultures and different right. kind of societies that have developed. Like there. Mars has a government, and it seems like it was the Chinese that took it over. Yeah, Mars is like is like uh, well, Mars is kind of a place where you have a corporate state, and, right? And it's like a corporation that that grew out of a Sino-Japanese conglomerate named Hua Gong. Mm -hmm. and uh, it's Mars is probably the best case scenario for a corporate state. It works reasonably well, there's some corruption, there's some advance, but the problem with Mars has is that because it was colonized essentially by robots mm -hmm. first, you still have a, a culture that has a, a lot of uh, artificial intelligence uh, enhanced androids and robots and they are essentially slaves on Hua Jing. Hmm. Yeah. And, and this creates an ethical question is if you have an intelligence, if you have an artificial intelligence that's sapient mm -hmm. and can think, I mean, does it have rights? Does it have the same rights as human beings? And yeah, that's right. a question I, I explore in the story. And I tend to answer that in the affirmative. Yeah, if, if, if anything can understand the concept of rights and start demanding them, well, yeah. then, then, yeah, then they are, have, of course, alive. Right, yeah, right, I totally right. agree with you on right, that one. Yeah, right. That makes too much sense. Mm -hmm. So theoretically, then you could have sex with a, a robot. robot. 
Or, yeah. or in the yeah, I, I'm thinking yeah. sex. Steve's thinking rape. I don't know yeah. why. But yeah, that does raise kind of an ethical question. Yeah. On, on Mars, they have like kind of a limiter that they put in the artificial brain so that uh, they can't revolt mm -hmm. and they have to obey human commands. Mm -hmm. And so the question becomes, well, can a robot have or an android have consensual sex with a human under these right. circumstances? And I didn't really resolve that, but I did mm -hmm. have a relationship. One of the what became the, one of the main characters of the story mm -hmm. is this uh, beautiful what we call a gynoid instead of an android. Okay. Because she's female form, you know, functionally right. female, and she's the consort of this wealthy billionaire who's really old and about mm -hmm. to die. Yeah. And uh, the the billionaire had had promised her that when he died, that he would manumit her and give her her freedom, get right. her off planet, because you, you can't have free androids on one mm -hmm. Um And then he had some evil nephews that screwed her out of it. Right, yeah, I remember that. And right, kind yeah. of, they, it was like one going against the other. And then, yeah, and, yeah. Yeah, and so our, our heroes, Seamus and Nilcoma, managed to get her off planet and, mm -hmm. and restore her inheritance as part of the story. And yeah, you're talking about robot sex. So she is essentially built to be a comfort android. Right. And it's, it sort of mm -hmm. makes sense. I mean, Considering all the sex toys that we have today, yeah. considering how one point technology right now, yeah. is advancing and you get more and more realistic, you know, sex mm -hmm. dolls and whatever, you're certainly going to have intelligent android, either female or male, yeah. companions, comfort, you know, machines, whatever you want to call them. And... Uh, you may even be able to program the sex you want at the time. Yeah. Well, you can program <laughs> the techniques, yeah. But if they're actually intelligent and sapient, then you can't force anything on sure, it, at least sure. not, not be ethical about it. The, the only problem is, is like how well, how that affect people's relationships. Like say there 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 there's a man who's not too happy with his wife, but he doesn't want to divorce her. If you get married, that is, which I wouldn't recommend. But um, you know, let's say he uh, let's say he um, uh, you know. Well, he can be monogamous without right, but a it, state, but yeah. Well, but he could cheat with another human just as easily as he could cheat with the Yeah, guy. but it, it seems like that would become like, the bridging first like societal problems with that. Is mm -hmm. that like, you know, either a wife would be really upset with his husband or his, you know, husband really upset with, with uh, his wife because, you know, he maybe, you know, was like, I, I feel more comfort with, with the android instead. Yeah. Well, I don't know. That's that's kind of an interesting question and something I haven't really explored in the story, and I don't know if I'm going to have time to maybe at right. some point. I knew that, not, not that my character, which I, she when after she's liberated, she renames herself as Murphy. Right. And Murphy, at one point in the story, has to essentially, in order to, uh, she gets separated from her friends, and mm. in order to rejoin them, she has to make a deal with a guy where she agrees to have a date with him, meaning she mm. has to have sex with him right. in order to get the means to, to mm. rejoin her friends. And so it's 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 a voluntary contract. Right. It's kind of a soulless kind of sex. It's it's it's, yeah. you know, it's, it's sex for money, and it's kind of creepy that way. But on the other hand, you know, it's it's fully consensual. There, you know, no one is shorter than the deal. But it made it made for a funny part of the story. It made for it sure. a funny yeah, part yeah. of the story. Yeah. Very and, funny. And it also kind of pointed out that doing sex away kind of short changes the guy making the payment too because yeah. he doesn't get the affection he just yeah. gets a physical sense and I mean you might yeah. as well masturbate that's yeah right. exactly you know so that that's the thing I always thought was kind of interesting about that was like you know he's thinking oh this is going to be great she's gorgeous and then afterwards he's just uh, like oh because he wanted a relationship that's what people want they want relationships they need human contact you know I mean there's all sorts of studies about you know actually just touching people patting them on the back stuff like that does stuff to your neurons where mm -hmm. it's like I'm happier now so yeah yeah, it's true. But, uh, Even babies, yeah, will will actually die if oh, they're not yeah, they won't physically thrive. held. They won't thrive if they're not held. Yeah, yeah not cuddled. Yeah, you know, it's very important. Yeah. Well, hey, thank you for coming yeah, up here welcome. and yeah, talking to us because you know we we were sitting there thinking like uh, that's that's a running gag on our show. Mm -hmm. Is is at, at the end of every show, the last minute or so, we say like, hey, we're going to talk about robot sex, and well, then we never get to whatever talk. whatever yeah. our topic is. We we relate it in some way. We we. We squeeze in robot sex yeah. into that topic. Yeah. And, and sometimes it's an awkward transition, too. <laughs> Super awkward transition for a couple yeah, of them. Yeah, well, I'm the expert on robot sex. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, so like, I, wanted to, I, want, I wanted to interview you simply because like, you're really kind of the inspiration about that. Because I was reading your comic. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah, I was reading your comic. And then I, I, I think I mentioned it one night at the meeting. It's like, well, what about like, what happens if they're you know, sentient robots? And then with that, 
we would get drunk and then start talking about robot sex, you know? Because we drink during our meetings. During the show, too. You guys all know that. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. Thanks for coming up. Well, thanks for having me. It's yep. fun. It's been yeah. fun. Yeah.